IT Pro TV, binge worthy learning for IT teams. Why is it binge worthy? It's learning presented in an engaging and entertaining talk show format that beats Voice Over PowerPoint snooze fests. Watch over 3,300 hours of content in their on demand library on your desktop, on the go, or in the comfort of your own living room. IT Pro TV is IT training you and your team actually want to watch, which means a better return on your learning investment. Get started with IT Pro TV for teams by visiting itpro.tv forward slash security weekly and start a seven day free trial and get 30% off standard or premium IT Pro TV memberships using the code SECWEEKLY30. Endgame automates the hunt for both known and never before seen adversaries in enterprise networks. Built on unique knowledge on the adversary's tools, techniques, and tactics, Endgame's centrally managed agent prevents, detects, and responds to advanced adversaries in the earliest stages of the kill chain without prior knowledge. Endgame, automate the hunt. Today's determined attackers easily bypass even the most advanced network defenses. Trying to ramp up staff to detect their back doors can cost thousands of dollars and take months, even years. With Active Countermeasures AI Hunter, we enable junior analysts to detect even the most advanced back doors in a matter of hours. Sign up for a demo and purchase our product today by visiting activecountermeasures.com forward slash PSW. Active Countermeasures. Make every analyst a hunter. Signal Sciences is the industry's first web protection platform that works in any cloud, any container, any platform as a service, and any modern application architecture. The Signal Sciences web protection platform can be deployed in next generation WAF, RASP, or reverse proxy modes, giving customers ultimate flexibility and coverage. Protect your web applications with Signal Sciences web protection platform. Signal Sciences, protecting applications, connecting teams. For more information, check them out at signalsciences.com forward slash PSW. Welcome back, everyone, uh, to Fall Security Weekly. I do have to say, speaking of uh, being at the trade shows, uh, I I do kind of like half kidding. I mean, we I, I like our sponsors' products. That's why they're sponsors, right? Uh, and I will be at our sponsors' booths now. A lot of times, the the folks at the the booth aren't the people we're working with, as we 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 kind of said. Uh, I think during the break, actually, um, and, and even during our segment, we said you know, they're like the local salespeople. And so I'll be at the booth and I'll be waiting and they'll be giving the sales pitch and talking about the product to potential customers. And I'll, I'll be standing, I'm like, you should totally buy that. I'm like, it's an awesome product. So I have a lot of sponsors in that respect. <laughs> they get a good, they get a good chuckle out of it. Uh, so I, you know, I play favorites, but the reason that we work with our uh, sponsors that we work with today is because we believe uh, in their products. And, um, you know, one of those sponsors is Javelin Networks, and it's a sponsor we met actually last year at, at InfoSec World, and they were just so awesome to talk with. Uh, Clayton, uh, hi Clayton, uh, who is at uh, uh, InfoSec World, and it's actually the our sponsors are where I go like when I need a break, right? So I'll walk the whole show floor. I'll focus on vendors that I've never heard of before in my life, then move on to ones that I have heard of, and then like when I need a break, I'll just go to our sponsors booth and I'll sit down. I'll be like. Like, dude, I just need to like sit and like chill for a minute and take a break and uh, talk with people like Clayton and, and folks. Uh, Cooper from Signal Sciences uh, was there. Uh, I think it was Brandon from uh, Brendan or Brandon from Endgame, uh, who's a, a, a big fan of the show. So I'll go there to kind of like chill out. So sorry to talk about vendors and, and trade shows, but that's lately that's what I've been doing. So that's what that's what your last couple of weeks was. It's my last couple of weeks. Uh, You're, and I'm I'm kind of disappointed. I I know it takes a lot of work, but I, I expect a younger man to have more stamina than you apparently have. Just well, saying. Uh, this last show is actually uh, the reason I'm, I got a nice big glass of bourbon is because it's helping my illness. Uh, ah. I, was, I had a, I was sick uh, at Infosec <sighs> World. Uh, probably one of the most sick. One of the most sick times I've ever been at a, a security conference, maybe even the most sick time I've ever had uh, at a conference in InfoSec World, uh, where I gave a talk on using open source software for security in the enterprise. Uh, very much didn't have a voice. You can kind of hear my voice going out again uh, tonight here on the show. So that's one reason why I needed probably more breaks than usual. Uh, walking around the show floor, Jeff, was, uh, you know, illness happens. But yeah. I did catch up on a lot of security news this week, and uh, it was kind of interesting. Uh, the stories I thought were really good this week, Jeff, and I wish I had more time to uh, delve into them. Uh, I actually just I flew in this morning from Orlando, so mm -hmm. um, 
what was interesting was there's Postgres uh, PostgreSQL malware attack. So they're attacking databases with malware that's delivered through an image. And right. I think the way it works, and again, I haven't read all the technical details, but there has been research published for some time that inside of an image, almost like a steganography technique, that when you render the image, there is a, a payload inside of the image that I believe it exploits the browser, right? So if I go to a website, there's an image. That image mm -hmm. can then uh, run executable code. In this case, the executable code was attacking Postgres, uh, which which has some flaws. And apparently 70,000 uh, Postgres servers were, servers were found on Shodan as being accessible. So I thought that was kind of an interesting attack. The article that we linked to isn't too great in the technical details, so uh, definitely search out some better technical details. Uh, so just kind of Google mix. Scarlett Johansson and you'll get there. And it does say in the article it was a G-rated image of Scarlett Johansson. They specifically called that out. They wanted to make sure the the rating of the image uh, and, and level of appropriateness of the image it was a G-rated image of Scarlett Johansson. And I'll just add, uh, not necessarily a new technique, maybe perhaps a new target. Correct. But, uh, the ability to embed executable code in all sorts of things. All not sorts of data formats, right? a new right? Yeah. concept. Yeah, exactly. But just kind of an interesting mixture. You had mm -hmm. Scarlett Johansson in the mix. You had the image and then Postgres. I thought the, that combination was kind of, kind of weird uh, and unique. Now... I literally just read this article uh, when I returned today that uh, Adrian Lamo um, passed away. We don't know. Mm -hmm. and did you read the story, Jeff, or hear anything uh, about this? I heard the headline. I didn't read the article, but I heard about this. So uh, Adrian Lamo was the, uh, uh, the hacker known for passing information that led to the arrest of Chelsea Manning, uh, mm -hmm. which have, was, of course, based on a, a, a WikiLeaks article uh, where the helicopter strike, they killed uh, seven people, that there was a journalist, uh, like a civilian on that uh, uh, aircraft. And uh, Adrian Lamo, who's the person who outed the source behind that leak, and yep. uh, apparently has passed away. Yep. It's kind of kind of interesting that there was a lot of controversy, obviously, around uh, that whole story, and we still don't know what the... Uh, he was only 37, so we don't know what the, the cause of death was. Yeah, and I remember hearing, you know, because, I mean, even the article you have posted, I think it's from last Friday or Saturday, sure. and uh, I remember, I don't know if I saw a headline or if, if it made one of the network news stations I listened to, but, you know, when somebody dies young and, it, and it's somebody that's involved in something like this, sure, uh, you can imagine that there's going to be all sorts of... Um, uh, you know, conspiracy theories and stuff like that popping up. So you would kind of want to see the follow up. Hopefully, they will come up with a you know cause of death and provide more explanation. Right. I want to say I heard something, but I don't want to say it on the air because I don't want to you know spread rumors. Spread rumors. Kind of like was it the New York Post that wrote the article that said Alex Stamos was leaving Facebook? Yeah, Times, I've seen that in a, a couple places. Okay. I was going to say, Times. this it, has been This article says the New York Times reported Monday that yeah. Alex Stamos was leaving Facebook. Now, Alex Stamos uh, subsequently has said um, that his role changed. He mm -hmm. says, um, uh, despite the rumors, here's the quote. Uh, he says, and I quote, despite the rumors, I'm still fully engaged with my work at Facebook. It's true that my role did change. I'm currently spending more time exploring emerging security risks and working on election security. So Which makes it sound like he got moved from his position. Yes. Um, what I was going to say, you know, just to start off the news segment, was it's it's been an interesting news week in as much as, especially for the stories that I posted. Most of these stories I didn't read about online. I was hearing about it on the news, you know, right. on, on you know, on the public news media. Sure. You know, it's a banner week. <laughs> yes. In, in security news, when it's when it's making the conventional news headlines. For sure. Proceed. <laughs> so, um, I actually don't know uh, Alex, and the article talks about his kind of 
deep history in the security community and being uh, a technical person and increasing his role at Yahoo and then of course moving to uh, to Facebook and I know mm-hmm. lots of people that do know do know Alex. Uh, I'd love to have him on the show. The problem is now I think that he's such a high profile figure that probably speaking to what would probably be considered as press, right, um, yep. is, is probably a, a really cha- tough challenge uh, for Alex as uh, even in a lot of the articles that I've seen on this, uh, both Alex and Facebook have not uh, been available for comment on uh, for a lot of things uh, in the, in the well, past year. Well, let's talk Facebook a minute. I mean, sure. you're, you're leading with the Alex Stamos element of it. Um, you know, Facebook's been in, like I said, the conventional news a lot this week, even earlier yeah, today. What got them in hot water? And again, I, I've this week, to be honest, I've only been paying attention to like the weather changing flights and, and right. working the vendor floor uh, at InfoSec and meeting up with friends and listeners and going to like the Magic Kingdom and stuff. So my week's been kind of weird. What happened with Facebook this week? That was, I saw some news articles, but I haven't really dug into it. Uh, I'm not going to get the story exactly right, but they've been, uh, you know, the, the issue is that they were involved either directly or indirectly through a, a company called Cambridge Analytica mm-hmm. on collecting uh, user data surreptitiously and not only like, uh, and it was more the work of Cambridge Analytica that apparently put out surveys on Facebook during the election season and if you agreed to do the uh, survey and you're, you're clicking, you know, Facebook wants to see your data or whatever, they were not only collecting your data but all your friends' data. So oh, the, that's the, bad. Yeah, the estimate is that they collected something like 50 million, you know, data on 50 million U.S. citizens and used that to help not necessarily manipulate the election, but they used that data to influence uh, – you know, by doing the things that Facebook does, pushing ads and pushing content, right. influence people's opinions in in terms of attempting to get them to vote a certain way. And uh, apparently, reporters, I want to say it was from a, a British British press, uh, had hidden video of them interviewing people from Cambridge Analytica that were basically bragging about all the stuff that they could do with collecting all this data and then having the data influencing people's uh, emotions and and uh, perceptions and so it, it 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 started out mostly as Cambridge Analytica but because it was done through Facebook uh, you know the larger issue I think is which is not news to us and we've talked about it before all the data that Facebook has available on on subscribers and uh, it, you know one of the morning news shows I watch, they they uh, t- the Today Show, they have a guy that does you know sort of the special interest mm-hmm. reporting, the, you know the deep insight reporting, and it was a couple of days ago he was opening up his phone saying, "Let's look," and he was going through all the menu of how do you get down to your settings to see how many different applications are feeding its data to Facebook. And you know, he opened up his phone. He's like, "Oh, I've got like 27 apps that are feeding in, you know data to Facebook. You know, turn that off, turn that off, turn that off." So, it, I think from a larger perspective, it's interesting that uh, more public awareness is being mm-hmm. uh, given to stuff that we've known about for a while. The fact that a lot of these social media uh, uh, companies collect a whole lot of data about its users, and you know, with that data comes responsibility. With that data comes the potential for misuse and the t- potential for exploitation, if not outright uh, illegal activities. So, Facebook somewhere just in the you know on the on the crest of this wave of uh, public recognition of stuff that we've kind of known about for a while. You know, Facebook tries to make Facebook a better place mm. by controlling some of the content. Some of the content they control is uh, information about firearms, tobacco, yep. alcohol, um, yep. and things of that nature, right? And, of course, inappropriate content. So, right. to some degree, they are uh, very much filtering that content and controlling what people can post. What would make Facebook 
an awesome place and I might actually go back on Facebook without even a second thought because I've been off Facebook for a little while. I might mm-hmm. actually go back on Facebook if they just said, you know what? We're not going to allow people to talk about politics on Facebook anymore. That would solve <laughs> their election problem and make yep. Facebook such a better place. Like, Think of the productive things we could talk about on Facebook if we just left politics <laughs> out of it. I'm just saying. Yeah, that's very true. I'm just saying. Um, I, I I don't have a link to it, but I you know I was watching the news uh, this afternoon before airtime, and um, there was you know just one of those ticker things mm-hmm. going along the bottom saying that Zuckerberg uh, was saying that you know maybe Facebook should be a regulated company, you know so apparently the talk is going in that direction, which. You know, all of this stuff is still bleeding edge, even though it's been around for years and years. But, you know, the the capabilities of all of this technology and all the information that's right. out there is so new in the grand scheme of things that, uh, you know, if there's going to be something good comes of it. Yes, things like limiting, uh, even limiting the political conversation or opting into political conversation yeah. or something yeah. like that with, or, or any topic, you know, it doesn't even have to be politics, but well, you know, uh, someone should create like open book. And if you want that, maybe there should be a place where people can talk about whatever the heck they want and post right. whatever they want. And, right. and that maybe that's open. And of course, I think we call that Reddit, but um, <laughs> the, I mean, the, I'm not saying me we should. So I guess is, what I'm saying, we shouldn't limit speech, right? But yeah. we need to pick places where speech is limited, where speech isn't. The problem becomes when you get to the size and influence of Google and a Facebook, that there has to be limits. And then when those limits are uh, abused, such as in the election, uh, influencing the election becomes a big thing. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, there's there's deeper issues, and you know, I'm speaking somewhat uh, uh, jokingly about you know how we limit content and such. But uh, I, I don't know. I think that there should be places where you can post whatever the heck you want. And maybe there are other places where you know it's certainly uh, limited. And some of those things are are good reasons to be limited, such as age restricted content, right? You don't right. want uh, children that are under a certain age to be exposed to certain kinds of content. So there are some good reasons for for limiting content. But then when we get into things like the election, like where do we start drawing lines about what people can post and cannot post? Um, and then how things can be manipulated is almost a whole other conversation that we've had a lot on this network about, well, how can you bypass some of those rules? And the other thing is, do you really even need to take out ads? to be able to influence peop- what people can see. If there are a billion Facebook users to, to reach a majority of those people, do you have to take out ads to do that? And how do you get your, your message out there? And how do you get around whatever Facebook's trying to filter to get your message out to that number uh, or enough people to be able to influence something? And that's a much deeper issue. I've actually talked about this years ago. I right? said so people are so paranoid about the government and what the government is doing to spy on us and what the government may or may not be filtering what we can and cannot say, even in a free country such as the United States of America. And my whole thing is, well, that might be kind of displaced thinking in that Google and Facebook kind of control what people are seeing and hearing almost more than a lot of governments do. And so who should we fear or voice our concerns about more? Is it what Google should be doing with their property, YouTube especially, and Facebook? Uh, Or is it the government? Or are they in cahoots with each other? So I think there's a lot of different issues at play. Uh, Again, I don't know Alex, but everything I've heard and read and and talked with people, I I think he's trying to really do the right thing. Uh, So I don't I don't you know, think well, poorly of his efforts in any capacity. And I think also I agree with the articles that have been written lately to bring it back to our, our stories in that having Alex at Facebook is a good thing uh, for security and privacy because it's kind of like the voice of reason. And there was some speculation like, is Alex leaving because he's just frustrated that he can't get his voice across by having someone like Alex there to make sure that they're transparent about some of these issues uh, Jeff, that you brought up in our news stories, right? 
transparency about what's happened with uh, some of these things. Well, you know, what was the first search engine? Do you remember? Alta Vista? Alta Vista. Uh, when Alta Vista came out, uh, I was still doing pen testing in those days, and Alta Vista was a great tool because you could you could find out all sorts of information. Back in those days, uh, you know, it was all about securing the perimeter, protecting your organization from the evil internet, mm-hmm. and so people were putting up border routers and, and firewalls and things like that, and they didn't know that most of the routers that they were setting up. Uh, spewed out promiscuous logs, and by default, they were public. You know, they were available as a web page, uh, and and they would so they would show up in Alta Vista searches. You know, in those days, if you did a word search on you know pick a topic, you would get every hit, and Alta Vista would go out and find everything, and you would get basically. And I don't know how they ordered it off the top of my head, but you know, if there was fifteen million hits you would get 15 million hits in some kind of order. I don't know right. if it was a proximity mm-hmm. distance thing or you know, the last time it was refreshed or whatever. What bothers me the most about search engines these days is the fact that it is filtered and tailored to you. And what bothers me more is that I think the general public doesn't know that it's filtered and tailored to you. Mm-hmm. So that if you do a a search on, you know, you want to buy a pair of shoes, you know, you're looking for running shoes. And so you Google it and you're getting tailored responses. They know where you are. They know, you know, they know your GPS location. They know what stores are nearby. They know what sales are going on. They know all that, but they don't, you don't, you no longer get the 15 million hits on Mm -hmm. Nike running shoes. You're, you're getting top 10 based on whatever they're, you know, pre-filtered based on your, 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 your tendencies and all the filter options. Mm-hmm. I, so the two things bother me. One is that they filter so much. I want to see the raw results. And I do this selfishly because uh, I like to see how much I show up on the internet. So I'll type in my name and how much I show – I'll type in Jeff Mann security and I'll see how many hits I get. But then I'll go to somebody else and I try to do somebody outside of my family, somebody mm-hmm. that doesn't have any apparent connection to me, and ask them to do do the exact same search and see how different the results are. And it, I find it fascinating, but is it how drastically is different is it? Most Jeff? people don't know that it's filtered content right. that they're getting. So in your in your somewhat scientific research, Jeff, how drastically different are those results? Hugely different. Really? Hugely different. Yeah, because, you know, either I happen to be Jeff Mann or because I search on security yeah, topics sure. a lot and security related topics a lot, I tend to have much more tailored results. Oh, I, I show up much more readily. But if you go out to somebody that has no apparent connection to me and do the same, you know, Jeff Mann security search, it's much fewer findings and it's, you know, they'll still hit like, some of the talks I've given that mm-hmm. are that Iron Geeks recorded and they're up on YouTube, that type of thing. In fact, I, I talked to a guy last week that I hadn't talked to in like 18 years, you know, a, a, a colleague, and he apparently Googled me before we talked, and he found the video of you and Josh Marpet uh, interviewing me out in Vegas last summer. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, how did that pop up first? I've never seen that one pop up first in any Google search I've done of myself, uh. but somehow that that popped up for him. Now, did um, you try Ask Jeeves? I mean, since we're talking about vintage search <laughs> engines. Yep, yep. That was a terrible one, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. But you got Alta me Vista thinking, like, cool other thing. than Alta Vista, what were the search engines? We, now, what's what's interesting is when uh, I think back in my, my, my nerd career, and you think about when you first heard about Google, right? Mm-hmm. And it's so weird to think about it the first time you heard about Google. And I remember my brother-in-law talking about it's his brother-in-law, Dave, that runs a, a software company. And yeah. we're talking about search engines one day. My brother-in-law, who are uh, actually, I was friends with him before I uh, married my wife. That's how I met my wife. And... Mm-hmm. So we're talking about search engines. Wait, you, you Googled your wife? No. Is that what you said? Oh, no, okay. my brother-in-law. I didn't Google oh. him. My brother and I were talking about search engines, Jeff. Okay, okay. Okay, I'm, right? I'm with- Before Google was like the big thing that it is now. And we we're talking about search engines. And I was like, yeah, like I use this one and that one. And he's like, 
dude, Dave told me about this one that he says it's the one you got to use. And he's like, it's called Google. And I'm like, mm -hmm. never heard of Google before. And now to think about fast forward to today and, and how Google is like a verb and stuff, like yeah. having that conversation with my brother-in-law seems like so freaking weird now that when they actually had the conversation about like what search engine was the best. They, right. People don't have those conversations anymore. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe with Bing a few years ago, they, they might have, but nobody has those conversations anymore. When you search something, it's Google. That's pretty amazing, I, I right. think. Well, that's your best answer to the question. You know, look at your web browser where you get to pre-select the, mm -hmm. the the search engine, and you know there might be six or eight of them up there, and I've never heard of most of them because yeah, right. I Google. That's about it these days. Right. But if I had my druthers, I'd still be using AltaVista. Just saying. AltaVista is um, pretty good. But the you know so the larger context of this is for the social media companies, for the search engine companies. I agree with you. There's so much data that's out there that they're collecting that, you know, they're just trying to make a buck. They're trying to find new ways to generate revenue, which is fine. I don't oppose that. Um, it is uncharted territory, and I think the natural progression is that uh, things will happen that later have to be regulated. I mean, that's that's sort of the pattern of society, uh, you know. So, Jeff, I, I know that you're not the world's biggest Bruce Schneier fan. Uh, <laughs> and you make a face every time I say I got this from Schneier's blog. But he right. genuinely, he posts some sometimes some really interesting stuff. And actually, for the past few years, he's been posting pretty regularly. And it's not like he's writing up this whole editorial. Like He just mm -hmm. tends to find some really interesting stuff and post it, uh, and it shows up in my feeds. So just based on that, this came from Bruce Schneier. They pointed out <laughs> an article. Um that says how we reverse engineered the Cuban sonic weapon and sonic weapon is in quotes attack. Uh, Kevin Fu is one of the authors, which I think is a, a great name. Um, and so it's a very, very lengthy article. Essentially the gist of it is right here in the first paragraph. I don't want to get this right. Um, Throughout the last year, mysterious ailments struck dozens of U.S. and Canadian diplomats and their families living in Cuba. Symptoms included dizziness, sleeplessness, headache, and hearing loss. Many of the afflicted were in their homes or in hotel, hotel rooms when they heard intense, high-pitched sounds shortly before falling ill. When they were examined by neurologists, symptoms were consistent with concussions but without any blunt trauma to the head. Mm -hmm. So just reading the opening paragraph, talk about describing the problem very well. I was right. very intrigued. Uh, I did not read the whole thing. It's a very, very lengthy article that then talks about the investigation as to how sound waves could potentially be used, whether with malicious intent or by accident, uh, be used to cause uh, these effects. Now, of course, uh, I think of many examples... Uh, that we've talked about on the show in books that I've read, Damon by Daniel Suarez specifically, uh, and other examples. And, and there is technology that exists today that does use sound waves to incapacitate uh, uh, potential trespassers or uh, people who are going to commit a crime. It's very heavily, not heavily, but it's known to be used by militaries uh, mm -hmm. and nation states. Very, very detailed article about how you would go about determining if this was uh, sound waves or not. Uh, Jeff, I don't know if you've heard of this technology or have any uh, knowledge of this topic or not. It's pretty fascinating read. Uh, no comment. <laughs> I love it. That's, that's the phrase I was expecting. Um, so it says... Uh, I too read books where stuff like this happens and I think it's been in James Bond movies. Sure. Uh, they that, do say yeah, ultrasonic. Most, most uh, fiction. I'm sorry. Ultrasonic emitters can produce audible byproducts that could have unintentionally harmed diplomats. It was their ultimate conclusion. But again, there's a whole a whole write up, which I think it's pretty cool. I think it's uh, interesting to read about. Uh, well, if you know about Wi-Fi signals, sound waves, and uh, radio waves are very really similar in, in certain characteristics. It's kind of interesting to read how uh, it can be used as a weapon. 
I am I am by no means any type of an expert on any type of this technology, but when you stop and think about all the signals that are flying through the air these days sure. on various frequencies, I mean, in the early days of cell phones, there was concern that you know yeah, holding a cancer, cell phone right. to your head was going to give you brain cancer, but. Uh, you know, we're inundated with all sorts of signals these days. I mean, I don't know how you have, I don't think you can avoid it. I guess maybe crawl into a lead container. Right. Um, then yeah, I think it's completely poison. possible, and I'm not basing that on anything I may or may not have involved, been involved with in a past life. Right. Uh, Move I, on. I can't Move say Move on. <laughs> having done podcasting, you know, for the pet this is our 14th year uh i have had headphones on and then all of a sudden there's some kind of malfunction uh or glitch in our audio gear that causes some kind of uh mm. extremely high volume decibel volume noise at whatever kind of frequency it's varied uh and it's very painful and very shocking and causes uh various reactions in the body right like yep. it, it it just it it causes intense pain and discomfort in varying different ways like i've actually had headphones that i've had on and doing stuff and like you just throw them to the ground and you don't even think about that like it's your body's just natural reaction to do whatever to make it stop so i can totally see this being a legitimate form of uh technology that's used uh against people so Fortunately, well, heck, that hasn't happened. It's not even time. James Bond. It's old Star Trek shows. Right? They this, the, they yeah, the it has been that... in, in Star Trek movies, yeah. Yep. All right. We got a lot of other stuff to talk about, too. We've been hey, talking we do. About... Um, I just saw it right before we went on the air, but apparently the city of Atlanta today got hit by a ransomware attack. Interesting. That took out took out a bunch of their systems. Yeah. Um, and I also just wanted to mention, uh, I put up an article about the CIS released a revised version of their top 20 critical security controls that if you, where did I put them, where did I put them, where did I put them, uh, I lost them, let's start over again. Um, you know, they were saying that their top five or six haven't changed. Their top, f- getting to it. T- the the title of the article is Sands Back to Basics. Have you heard me talk about how we need to get back to basics and things have never changed? The first six CIS critical security controls are inventory of authorized and unauthorized devices, inventory of authorized and unauthorized software, secure configurations for hardware and software devices, continuous vulnerability assessment and remediation, controlled use of administrative privileges, maintenance, monitoring, and analysis of audit logs. Do those six things and most of your problems go away. Hmm. And yet we spend how many billions of dollars in this industry? The whole tech segment that we had right. talking about the t- cool new tools and technology sure. that may or may not do these six things, but probably are doing some sort of variation on a theme. Yeah, and you know what's interesting is my talk at the conference was uh, how to use open source tools for security in the enterprise. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and a, a lot of which those things that you just mentioned, Jeff, uh, there are open source tools available uh, to help you do that. And and more and more every day. In fact, we just did a, a webinar with a vendor, ironically enough, a sponsor, Lockrhythm, uh, right. and talked about open source and commercial tools that can uh, help with threat hunting. And it's just amazing. Like every day I'm learning more and more about you know open source tools that can help, free tools to help you with that. Of course, there's baggage that goes with open source tools, uh, much of which I, I cover in my talk, uh, which went really well. So hopefully you'll see that at a conference uh, coming soon as it's one I'll be giving this year and submitting to uh, to other shows, uh, conferences rather, as it comes up. So, uh, But if you look at these, you know, they're basically saying know what you have, know what's yeah. in your environment, secure what you know about and monitor everything and keep track of who has access. Um that would be a great segue into the death of application security. I don't understand. I, I All I saw was this headline. This is application security is dead. And it says the nature of the field has changed greatly because of the move to the cloud and enterprise digital transformation. 
Well, I read through the article, and and I'm not sure where they got the headline from, frankly. But the gist of what I got out of the article was, uh, and I guess part of this is probably based on my perception. Uh, you know, things are things are changing very quickly. You know, the the new cloud environments, the 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 dynamic environments, things are created and dissolved and containerized. There's DevOps, there's Agile. Everything's moving so fast; it's very hard for security teams to keep up. You know, uh, I yeah. Again, well, I'm not going to pick on anybody. Let me keep this generic. Yeah, uh, and don't, very don't often, pick on Tyler that wrote the article because he works for Signal Sciences, who's one of our sponsors. But I'm still going to pick on him for using the dead theme because I well, hate it when we declare that, things. But the, I hate but it when we declare things as dead. If you're going to write a web <laughs> application, and you know, you're going to put it through some sort of software development lifecycle process. Where classically, I'm trained to say you build security into every step of the step of the way from the design phase through the architecture phase and implementation phase and so off so forth ask how that works in a in a devops environment ask how that works in an agile environment i have yet to find anybody that can to answer that question it's like security doesn't exist in these things because their their solution is well if something goes wrong you just dissolve it and you rebuild from a known state and you move on which may solve a lot of problems. I don't know, but it doesn't seem to to me to solve fundamental problems. So right. I I think what the gist of saying application security is dead is more like application security has been OBE'd, overcome by events. Well, yeah, things are I, moving so quickly you can't even keep up with application. I security. think what Tyler was trying to say is application security as we've traditionally thought of it, it yep. is is no longer that it's completely new. Um, and I've known Tyler for a long time. And again, Tyler is uh, works for Signal Science as a sponsor of the show. Uh, right. it, it's the you know the whole dead thing. But I think Tyler was trying to make a point, as most of us do when we declare something is dead, is to get people's attention and say something yep. significant has really changed. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was Richard Steenen, right, that declared IDS is dead. And we all kind right. of moaned and groaned. And we're like, well, that's a gross exaggeration. And maybe at the time it was. And then we look towards today and we're like, well, yeah, uh, maybe Richard was was was, was right. Um, I just, the whole concept of declaring things as dead is, um, I don't know. I think it's kind of cliche. But uh, if I and take yet, the... here we are talking about it. Here we are talking. And I think that's why they, they right. being, you know, the people trying to make a point... Phrase it as dead is so that we'll talk about it, right? So I think Tyler social engineered all of us into talking about his article. Um, right. and, and so, but rather than saying things have dead, to say things have made a complete and total shift and we need to rethink the way that we've uh, thought about things, uh, sure, like we saw that with IDS and we had to completely rethink the concept of intrusion detection. Mm -hmm. I think Tyler is correct. If he had phrased the article as "we need to rethink application security," I, I'd be on board with that a hundred percent, right? It's just that well, kind of I, cliche I, hook of "it's dead." But in terms of application security, what what I heard you saying, Jeff, and what what Tyler's saying in the article is that things have shifted so much that the way we think about applying to security, applying security to applications, is so drastically different from the way we've traditionally thought about it that. We need to kind of wake up as an industry. And to get us to do that, we need to use titles like Declare Something is Dead, which is fine in, in this case after we've gone through some explanation yep. of it. Um, in that context, he's absolutely correct. So much yep. so that we created an entire new show called Application Security Weekly. Um, yep. So, and I've talked about this on, on many different shows. When I started deploying some of our own internal applications in some of the newer methods and in, in containers and looking at DevOps, I was like, wow, like the entire way we develop software has completely changed from mm. 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even maybe even five years ago that we need to rethink security uh, as it applies to this process. Uh, it, it, that is certainly true. I also think that one of the other reasons we created the show is <clears throat> security people in this field today don't 
like uh, get in tune with the way application development is done today. And that's a mm -hmm. huge problem. Uh, it took me quite some time. I actually spent time going hands-on, working with an application to understand, like, how would I apply security in this model? And after I thought about it, I'm like, yeah, holy crap, that is totally different. I think it's a mm -hmm. good thing. It doesn't mean that security is built in. It means it's easier for security controls to be built into the process than it was before, is my take. And there are many that agree with me on that point. Um, it, so in that I don't, context... I don't disagree with you on that, but I think it's also just as easy to not have security built in. You know, so where, where, where gains are being made on the one end, the... the, the uh, I completely uh, agree, Jeff. Yes. And I've actually said this on, on other shows that you can create an insecure app way faster and more efficiently than you could before. But sure. on the flip side, you can apply security more efficiently and faster than you could before. Right. right. And, right. and I think that's why I had a, a, such a tough time with this title about application security is dead. It's not dead. It's, just, it's very, very different. <coughs> and also very much a double-edged sword, as we've talked mm -hmm. about. <coughs> Carry on, Jeff, while I just die here for a minute. Sure. All right. <laughs> well, if I may, let, let's segue to, I think, one of the other big stories of the week. And that is Uber. Um, you know, they, they are doing self-driving tests. Uh, I want to say it was in Arizona. Um, and a pedestrian uh, was killed by a self-driving car. Now, I, I haven't read or seen any news in the last couple of days because I posted the story earlier in the week. But from what I've heard, uh, the car wasn't at fault in that the uh, pedestrian uh, apparently stepped out in front of the car for whatever reason. They weren't in an intersection. You know, whatever the circumstance is, um, going beyond the specific instance, uh, you know, I think back to uh, last year, Jack Daniel and I took a road trip. Uh, he picked me up and we headed out to B-Sides Nashville. And we were somewhere in off-road uh, sort of eastern Tennessee. We had just crossed the border and we wanted to get some breakfast, so we stopped at a Waffle House. And the waitress in some little podunk town in eastern Tennessee, we, she was talking to the table next to us and she was, we, we derived from what she was saying that she was in college. She was taking a course and her thesis or topic of whatever she was doing, I guess a research paper on, was artificial intelligence and specifically self-driving cars. And she was talking about the the uh, ethical ramifications of how does, a, how does a, a car, how does the logic of the car make a decision over uh, the people that are in the vehicle versus people in other vehicles versus pedestrians? How do, how do you build in those ethics of you know making choices of how to avoid an accident or how to make a decision that's going to cost it, a all, life? All and we're this, like, Jack and I are looking at each other like, wow, this is not the conversation you'd expect to find in Podunk, Eastern Tennessee. It's 7 a.m. in the morning. Wait for really the Waffle House in Tennessee. Would, wow, that's interesting. Yeah. So, but... I mean, that's that's sort of, uh, you know, this was a, a hopefully an isolated incident, but you have to, you have to. Step Wait, the back Waffle and House think. was an isolated incident or the. The the pedestrian being killed hope, by a self-driving car. So there hopefully was, in fact, a pedestrian isolated. killed by a self-driving car in Arizona. Yes, yes. It happened. Uh, I think it was over the weekend. There was a there. There was the first fatality uh, of, uh, involving a, a self driving car. And ironically, there was like a safety driver in the car, but still there was a fatality. Wait, so, there was a person in the self driving car that had control over it. Yet it still ran someone could, over. could have taken control over. I, I okay. think the self driving car was in, was, you know, you know, it was doing its thing, and th but there was a person that could have taken over, and but it, I guess it happened so quickly. Somebody just happened gotcha. to step out in front of the car. Um, but you know the larger philosophical issues of self-driving cars. One of the one of the 
uh, things that I've heard about why we should move to self-driving cars is because they will ultimately be safer, mm -hmm. reducing human error. But I have to think, okay, uh, but that doesn't mean it's a hundred percent. There, you know, somehow we're gonna we're gonna build in uh, 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 an expectation of normal that. Uh, a certain amount of people will die because of self-driving cars, but it'll be less than the number of people killed by human-driven cars, and so we're better off. But it does kind of make you pause and scratch your head, and you know, because we all—I think most of us think, well, I'd rather be in control. You know, it should be us. You know, we shouldn't let the machines take over. But I don't know where I'm going with it. But I just think it—it—it it, it, it definitely is taking everybody. Uh, to take a time out and, and Uber has suspended its program at least for a little while until they do an investigation. But it, you know, it, it just, it's another example of how technology is changing the world. And, you know, the, the things that we've talked about tonight, social media, the data that's gathered, the, the, the capability of wrongdoing, but even in this instance, there's some sense of, normal that we're going to come to expect uh with you know i don't think self-driving cars are going away I it think just puts that black coming. mirror uh, do you watch black mirror jeff i do watch black mirror did you yes. see the episode that surrounds the self-driving vehicles uh not so if much i did it doesn't come to mind i've seen most of the episodes but that <sighs> one escapes me it's hard to talk about it without without giving it away but addresses well, this then, issue specifically I, I will say i don't want to yeah. give it away for our listeners and i, and I hate yeah. it when when shows say well well if you want to watch the show like don't listen like i'm just not going to give away any spoilers or anything close to a spoiler i will say that if this issue uh and many technology issues as it relates to uh society uh and everyone's lives uh, mm -hmm. are interesting to you as probably much of our audience does right you should definitely check out black mirror and there is an episode in black mirror that does involve uh self-driving vehicles i'll leave it at that um and it's kind of like a blend of science fiction horror there's a, an element of horror in uh mm -hmm. and i'm not a huge horror fan because i i to be honest with uh, little known fact about me like i get freaked out when i watch like really scary horror movies like it's not my thing um <laughs> but the science fiction horror movies or sci-fi horror uh i find pretty cool uh and i can watch those uh and, and get a lot of enjoyment out of watching them and black mirror is definitely on that line uh yeah. which makes it very entertaining for me because it has that technology factor so definitely check that out um do you have any idea which episode which season uh i don't i could probably pull it up uh, if I looked it up pretty, uh, pretty quick, go ahead and talk about another. Uh, there was another story in here that I wanted to make sure that we hit. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you read about the Apple glitch with Siri? Uh, I did not read about the Apple glitch with Siri, and I and did we do, we talked about last week about uh, was it Alexa that was you know just yeah, spontaneously laughing, the laughing. laughing, the creepy laugh, yeah. Although the, I, I didn't read the thing about Siri, but again, I, I, I watch, I'm an old guy. I watch network news or, or what I call the social media news or entertainment news. And one of the uh, shows I watched was talking about uh, – they were saying about how all these apps – and I, they might have been referring to the Siri thing. They read your email because they're always – especially in your phone, they're always telling you what the responses should be. And they're like, they know that because they're reading your email. And they're like all freaked out and trying to get people paranoid. So um, if you found Black Mirror, great. Otherwise, I have not read the Siri article. What happened with Siri? Uh, I, I don't know. I just kind of I, I just read the headline and then the article uh, this week. Uh, uh, apparently, it was reading messages out loud. Um, but hidden, hidden. What's a hidden? hidden I, I don't know what a hidden. I don't know what it means. The links in the show notes if you want to go read it. Um, so the episode of Black Mirror is uh, in the fourth series. It was written by Charles Brooker uh, and directed by John Hillcoat. Uh, it of course aired on Netflix uh, in December of 2017. It was filmed in Iceland uh, and. I won't even read the, the description because it kind of 
it, it kind of gives it away uh, on, you know, I'm reading from Wikipedia. Uh, but the episode is called Crocodile. Ah, uh, yeah. I was wondering if yeah. that's the one. I have seen that episode. Yeah. I was wondering if that's the one you Series were Series 4, to. episode 3. And that's a, that's, I've seen most of the Black Mirror episodes, yeah. and that's probably one of the more, if that's in the top three of the disturbing episodes it, yeah there are some very disturbing episodes yeah that that, yep. that one's up there for sure yeah i forget how that ends. we'll talk after the show how it ends but <laughs> okay i forget how that show end, that that particular episode ends and netflix is not a sponsor just to, netflix just to, is not a sponsor yeah. but they are a customer of bug crowd now uh which is one other story that i wanted to get to uh keith who of course works for bug crowd uh, yep. fantastic organization. I can't say enough great things about them. Congratulations to them for working with Netflix to provide bug bounty programs uh, for Netflix. So you can find those uh, in the link in the show notes. We'll link to it. And if you're looking to make some money on some bug bounties, now you can go do some bug hunting on Netflix, which is That's awesome. pretty cool. And I did see that headline. If there's nothing else. I think that rounds it out for this week. I want to thank everyone for listening and watching. Uh, and we'll see everyone next week on Paul Security Weekly. Over and out. <laughs>